everyone. I'm Audrey Lane. I am the co-director of the Days of the Dead International Film Festival, and we are thrilled to have the writer-director of the film you just watched, Abruptio, um, Evan Marlowe. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. So many questions. So many questions. So upon watching this, um, we never read the um, bios or look at really anything. We're kind of like, we're just going to watch the film. And as we're watching, it's like there's, this had to be a painstaking um, effort to make a film like this. Because as far as we know, we've never seen a film that quite mixes the, me has the mixed media and puppetry and aspects of this. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was painstaking, <laughs> to say the least. It took about eight years or so to make it. I'm um, sorry, did you say eight? Yeah, about eight, yeah, from, from, from script writing to post. Um, I started it right after we finished our second feature, about 2013 or 14. And then I had this stupid idea to put the puppets in the lead. <laughs> um, well, the, the concept, I think, is that you take, you get some voice acting, and then you put it on the shelf, and you go ahead and make the movie. Um, and you can either do it with animation or some other thing. Um, and we just just decided puppets, and then I wrote a script that used, that capitalized on the idea of puppets um, thematically. Um, so it did give us the, the luxury of taking our time to make it, but unfortunately a lot of stuff happened along the way, and it was a very difficult uh, task. I can imagine. Um, so a lot of times when you see things that were similar to this, they did not have the articulation, they did not have the movement, um, it was very unique. How was that concept de de designed? Um, because it looked, I don't know, it just looked so lifelike, but yet it, we knew it was puppets, but it was, you know, it took your eyes a bit to adjust, because when we started watching it, I think it took about a good 10, 15 minutes for my brain to match what I was watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to, that's why the beginning of the movie is a little slow, because I knew I couldn't just throw people into this weird world. It just, was, as it is, if you go slowly, it's still a little bit off-putting to say the least. So um, that's why I kind of introduced the idea of, of puppets gradually built the world slowly over the course of about 10 minutes and then kicked it in um, once I assume people would get accustomed to it. A lot of people still don't like puppets and are unnerved <laughs> by it no matter what, they, what they're doing. Um, but as far as the design of it, it was really kind of trial and error because like you said, nothing's been done like this before. So it took a bunch of time with working with materials and all that with our fabricator um, and eventually we found something that was lightweight that could, you know, emote. Um, we, we thought about silicon, which Dr. Travers was silicon, but mm -hmm. it's really heavy and it's, it's harder to work with and it tears. So we kind of did that one character, but then I we put that aside and went to like, I think it was foam latex for the rest of it. It's just a little easier to work with. Um, and we just shot, we, you know, shot each character's scene so that we could kind of retire it because only Les is the only one that I think endured the entire eight years. Uh, and so, you know, we didn't want to take any chances. We just filmed their scenes and then just set them aside in storage. So, um, gosh, I just lost my question because you just said something that made me want to ask another question. Um, when you wrote the script, did you already have particular people in mind that you wanted to use? Uh, well, you kind of did. Um, and then when you cast them, you rewrite the script to fit that person. Like. Uh, you know, with Sid Egg, it was pretty obvious how to write that part, but you had a you know, g general idea of, of how the character should speak, but then you, you really fine tune it once you cast the actor. Um, who was the first actor you cast for this? I think it was James Marsters. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Was, yeah, and he worked great. Um, and we worked really well in the booth. We kind of evolved his character from kind of like a, you know, a limp noodle at the beginning to somebody who just kind of gets empowered by the violence, mm -hmm. and then at the end kind of eventually gets accountability, you know, because he obviously lacks accountability throughout this movie. So we kind of work that into his voice performance as the movie goes along. And did you build the other characters around them, even though they're not having, of course, the physical interaction, but when they're having the banter, the dialogue back and forth, um, how did you frame those char um, those actors around as you started to cast? Uh, in what sense? Um, like, so once you got James Marsters and you started fill, um, filling the other roles, were you um, purposely um, selecting like certain people that you felt had the best, not only chemistry, but it, even though they're, because a lot of times when you're doing films yeah. face to face, there's that chemistry. Yeah. How did it work bouncing those yeah. off of each other? I think so, because this is kind of like a Wizard of Oz thing where he meets all these strange characters and you don't want them to be all the same. You all want each character to have its own personality. And especially for the female, we even put a lot of thought into it because a lot of 
Hollywood actresses have very deep voices now for some reason. So we, we didn't want that in this character. We wanted somebody who was sort of light, and kind of floated along. So we kind of really worked hard to find the right actress for each part so it would all kind of balance out in the end. Nice. Um, so when you were talking about the applic, um, I think we were talking about the applications of the silicon and different things. Um, how many different trials did you have to go through to figure out what was going to work, and what was going to work on film, and also, um, maybe that's a two-part question. So as the puppets now worked, anybody inside the thing, so did they have to have any, it was a total build? Yeah, well, again, it was trial and error, because we it was hard to keep a head up like this for uh, take after take. So we realized we created a, a PVC frame and just needed the upper torso and head for it. So that's eventually we, we landed on the just building that part of it up and putting it on a frame. Um, that offloaded the puppeteer's hand so he could just focus on the performance and not keeping this thing up in the air. Um, so that was kind of it. And then the rest of it, we just had a very good fabricator, Jeff Farley, who we just got lucky to get. And he and I just worked on it. And uh, once we landed on him, it was it was really easy, actually. Oh, it's pretty amazing. Just. There was so much for the eye. There was so much um, for you to to see because even when the puppets were moving, there was still the background and like you could kind of you know things that were going on. So it looked like an actual as the puppets are moving, you could the scenes are going on behind that. How did you accomplish that? Because when I was looking at it, now we've seen this movie like four or five times. I feel like I see something different every time. There's a lot of background action that. I didn't notice, I think, the first time I watched because I was so focused on the puppets themselves. Yeah, this is one of those movies where you, if you spend eight years working on a movie, you will put a lot of stuff into it. Um, and I, I, there's a lot of motifs and a lot of um, clues. There is a clue that guides the viewer to decode another clue. There's just so much stuff in here. There's a lot of uh, callbacks to 70s and 80s sci-fi and horror mm -hmm. that if you know the genre really well, you'll pick all those little things up in the wardrobe and. It's just because it just had so much time, I had to fit a lot of stuff into it. So yeah, I, I agree with that. There was a lot of stuff loaded into this movie. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't notice because like no. I said, I was so engaged with the puppets and looking and trying to figure it out, and just, you know, with the eye blinks, the mouth mm -hmm. move, movement yeah. um, and things like that. And then, like I said, as we watched it, I was like, oh, I notice this. Oh, yeah. this is cool. Yeah. I see all this stuff going yeah. on. Um, <laughs> is anyone in the audience besides George? No. <laughs> have a question because I know he's loaded. <laughs> well, I, I want to follow up on the puppeteering, especially the wide shots, because we have watched it multiple times and I still haven't figured it out. Yeah. Also, the running shots. Yeah, well, you know, all film is magic, really. It's 24 <laughs> pictures in a second that make you convinced that you're watching some motion. So um, I just think everything is sort of a magic trick, but this film in particular was a magic trick. and every scene presented itself with something like how do you get them to smoke or drive a car um, or lay an egg. <laughs> <laughs> so these were just, every scene had its little challenge we had to unlock and uh, we couldn't do it with puppets for every single thing. We had to have a, a body double for some of the white shots sort of thing with a mask that looked like the, the puppet. So those are just certain things that we had to problem solve but 95% of it is puppeteer. Tell me about the eyes. No, we didn't. We didn't have the budget to do, you know, uh, autom you know, automatic eyes or anything like that. So they're static eyes. Um, the eye blinks I did myself. I don't know anything about CGI, but I had to teach myself to do it and then refine it over the course of about nine months to do all the eye blinks, and it was a real pain to do that. Wow. <laughs> it was not a fun time in my life. But um, but and then some eye motion that was CGI. The our our guy back in England did some eye motion, but not very much of it. There was one character, uh, Dumkopf, the attorney, who did have a floppy eye. He could, <laughs> as he was puppeteering, he could do this and wiggle the eye up and down in one eye. Um, but aside from that, they were all static, uh, creepy eyes. <laughs> and they which also good. Jeff hand painted each one of them, too. Uh, right here, please. Uh, hi. Um, hi. First of all, I really enjoyed that. I've definitely never seen anything quite like that. Um, now, I, other than the more fantastical elements in the film, I noticed that it finds a lot of horror in mundane reality. Was there any specific inspiration for that? Uh, well, I mean, I think that is one of the sources of where most of the horror comes from. Yeah. I, I think um, I think that started probably uh, in the 60s, late 60s, uh, when we realized 
uh, that you could depict a sniper on the freeway in the valley and it's just some dude that lives next door to you and that's a lot scarier than all the, the monsters actually that were coming before. And then we realized, you tapped into that, um, then all the everyday horror became a lot more terrifying. So I kind of agree with that. And, um, and then, so the premise of this is that we're all being manipulated by something externally or in, internally. Um, so that's kind of it too. But then the catharsis being that we're not really manipulated, that we can cut those strings and take charge of our lives and we don't have to be manipulated by it. Great question, thank you. Did you have another? Yes, yes, true. Yeah, you have to Google the title, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> I did, I did. <laughs> All right, thanks for coming. George? Yeah, it's more it's like, it took eight years, and to make sure that you maintain continuity with that law, were there any changes that were, that you had to, you had to make because of that length of time, or that you just wanted to change throughout that duration of eight years to the, to the story, or that you had to make because of the puppet that it just wasn't able to maintain? I don't think so. I mean, it's hard to keep a film straight in your head for any length of time, but this is a very long time to keep all those parts moving. And um, so you just had to keep, you had, a very, had to have a very good understanding of the film, the finished film when you started the movie, as far as the voices and everything else and the look of it, and just keep coming back to that idea that you had in your head. And I think as long as I kept doing that, I was fine. Um, sometimes I got some ideas, you know, like, you know, I'm enthusiastic, throw things in there, but if it deviated everything off course, I immediately got rid of it. It's like, kill your darling, so I just couldn't do it. So, but but the, the idea is you just, you got a very good, firm idea in your head, and you just stick to the plan the entire year, years and years of making the film. Well, Abruptio was, and it is Abruptio, Abruptio, Abruptio. Yeah. Abruptio. <laughs> I think the first time we heard it, pronounced the correct way is when um, James did his um, intro. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and I was like, oh. Robert, Robert England was saying, abrotillo. So he made it very beautiful and elegant. <laughs> yeah. And then I was just at um, Macabro in Mexico City, and they say, abrotillo, everybody oh. says. So I'm learning something every time. The Fancy. Film I like that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how was that? Um, I, um, that film being seen there and that it um, different, very different. Yeah. How did um, was the what no, was the reception? It was very, very enthusiastic. I think it's the sort of thing that probably plays well there. Uh, it's just so weird, um, and they're into that kind of dark yeah. thing. It really was. I was treated like a celebrity. I was getting autographs, and awesome that's photos. So cool. It was like I felt like I was upstairs, you know. Awesome. <laughs> well, that's Maybe someday. No, that, well, <laughs> hey, absolutely. That, I mean, that's amazing, and that's you know how we want all filmmakers to be treated. But I, we do know that um, a lot of good horror is going on down there. They have some incredible incredible festivals um you know kind of watch them online and share their things but they um really have come to have some really staple um film festivals down there um that show a lot of love especially you know the things that are off the cuff and this was definitely <laughs> off the cuff and i think as we watch films and um you find those gems that are just so different and so mind-blowing I mean, I literally, I had to take a break when we watched, I'm like, oh my gosh, I was like, my, my. and I have um, vertigo, and so sometimes, like, the movements in the cars, I was like, okay, hang on a yeah. second, but that was good, it was different, it was not like someone's just driving a car, you've got that other element moving as the car is moving. You're not the only person, this movie's made sick, so. Really? Yeah, you're well, not sick, it was just a little, <laughs> like, a little woozy, because when I get it, look, everything starts to spin, oh, either round oh, ways, good, yeah. and so it was just like, okay, I should my put eyes, a warning at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> that'll make it do any better but like we want to see it yeah. <laughs> well um, can you tell everyone how to find you and keep up with you and see what you're working on next uh, well abruptio.com is the, the website it's I think it's abruptio film is the Facebook page where I put regular updates um, we're in talks with distribution and it's gonna be a good one we're awesome. excited about it um, and that's still ongoing but we should hopefully get all that wrapped up soon and either late this year or early next year you should see it in theaters and, and distribution Awesome. Yeah. That, that would be great. Um, and, you know, everyone here, Sig was a big part of Days of the Dead for years. He went to at least three, four shows a year for, gosh, what, like five or six years. So everyone here is missing him. So I love that, you know, when this came through that we saw that he was a part of it and that meant a lot. Um, and I love the for Sid at the mm -hmm. end. So um, I think this is going to be one that is so different than anything he's done that you know people are gonna fall in love with it just because it's like we've never seen Sid this way so that was really cool he's so not that person he's such a nice 
<laughs> he's just a lovely guy. We didn't spend that much time with him, but we could tell he was just such a lovely Oh, he, he was very, guy. very sweet. Yeah. Um, Thank you for being Thanks. here. Thank Thanks you for, for sharing us. your project with yeah. us. Um, we hope it does great things, and we can't wait to see it in theater. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Thank you.